Alrighty, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our transfer Q&A. Uh, my name is Karen. I am a fourth year psychology major and I am one of the peer academic advisors for the School of Social Sciences. Uh, just like all of you, I am also a transfer student. I transferred from Long Beach City College. However, I'm not from Long Beach. I'm from Southeast LA. Uh, during this panel, students will be provided with some quick explanations about their degree check. Uh, we prepared some panel questions for our PAAs to answer. And in the end, you will all have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A chat, which is the little button down there that says Q&A, um, if some questions were not answered. Um, so you guys are all welcome to ask questions throughout the panel. However, please keep in mind that we will not be answering questions until the end of the session. Um, please do not write your questions in the general chat because that is going to be reserved for resources and links. Um, so I will provide more details about that as we go on. Uh, this session will last an hour and 30 minutes, so we all hope that you stay because we are going to be answering your questions. Um, but for right now, our lovely academic advisor, Stella, is going to start with some important reminders about your degree check. Hi, everybody. Uh, I haven't done Zoom in a little while, so sorry already. I apologize in advance. I'm technical, technologically challenged um, and Zoom challenged, so um, bear with me. But it's nice to kind of virtually meet all of you guys. Um, um, as Karen mentioned, I'm Stella Magai. I'm one of the full-time academic advisors in the Social Sciences Undergraduate Student Affairs Office. Um, so some of you might have received an email from me or one of the other um, full-time academic advisors in regards to your enrollment. So your fall um, course suggestions, as well as attached a degree check. Um, so I am just gonna go over briefly. So um, it is a sample degree check, just of a random student. Um, so to give you a general idea of understanding. So if you are near your computer and have your degree check, you could follow along on your own um, or just kind of take note of anything that you might have questions about. Um, and you can always reply to the email that you were sent from the full-time academic advisor. Um, even though it might've seemed like it was an automatic email, it was actually sent by a person. Um, so some people don't think they can reply to it, but you can reply to it, we are real people. Um, so that's just in, in case it is something specifically about your own um, situation or your own account. Um, because this is a public forum and kind of a webinar and we're recording it and going to post it, um, any questions that you might ask um, in the Q&A, please make sure it's not something specifically about your um, count or like classes you should take specifically or anything like that because we can't share that information um, with others, just yourself. So just starting off with that. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. You guys see it, hopefully, yes, I hope so. Um, but yeah, so this is um, a degree check for a fictional student um, and it's for the BA in psychology and his name is Joey. Um, <laughs> oops, um, so his name is Joey and so what you will kind of see here is there's nothing listed for the university requirements which are entry-level writing, American history and American institutions. Um, for those requirements, the all of your files are being processed right now by the Office of admissions so it does take a while for that information to be processed some some of you might have done these requirements during high school during a community college or other college course um, or with a, by a test score of some sort so it does take a little while for all of that to be processed so if you don't have these marked off feel free to kind of later in the fall quarter contact your full-time advisor um, and have them check on that if it's not already showing up on your file but for now um, that that information is going to be blank. Same with if we scroll down to the bottom of the degree check where you can see the 180 units, everything like that, it's not showing any transferable units for students. Um, that is also still being processed. So um, it does take a little while for that information to be available. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, it will probably be by, I would say, week six of fall quarter um, for that information to be available for that. Um, so just starting with that. Uh, in regards to kind of what the degree check consists of, the left column is the general education requirements. So if you're a California um, community college transfer student, if you completed IGETSI, which is um, basically the general education curriculum for the California um, community colleges, then um, we would need that to be sent to us. So hopefully in the chat, um, one of the advisors could put the information on how you can send your official IGETSI if we haven't received it. Um, some 
community colleges do post your official UCI Getsy on your transcripts. Um, however, you might have already sent your transcripts to UCI earlier than your school was going to be providing it. Um, so sometimes that does happen. So just make sure that we have your iGetsy. Um, that can that may be on your transcript, maybe on a separate iGetsy form. Um, just make sure that you do get that sent to UCI sometime between now and the end of fall quarter. Um, so the earlier the better. If you're a UC transfer or you're not from a California community college, you have no idea what IGETC is, um, so don't worry about that. Um, but we're gonna go for the most part, most of you are California community college transfers, so we'll kind of talk a little bit about IGETC. Um, IGETC covers everything in the left column except your upper division writing. So upper division writing is always taken here at UCI. Um, for students, most of the time they take it at the end of their junior year, so this would be the end of this year or beginning of your senior year. So that class um, would be something that would be numbered 100 through 199, which is upper division, and has a W at the end. So that's how we indicate it's a writing course. So when you're looking at the schedule of classes, you can actually filter GE category 1B to see what qualifies. Um, but again, not something you would take your very first quarter. Um, we recommend it usually um, once you kind of get used to UCI and the quarter system. Um, the other requirement that it that I guess he doesn't fulfill is the math requirement, which does need to be taken for a letter grade, just like all of your major classes. Um, this lists the two different options that a student does have in order to fulfill that requirement. Um, one option is taking a year long probability and statistics sequence, which is social science um, 10A, 10B and 10C. Um, the other option is taking two quarters of calculus and one um, quarter of statistics, which is the second option, Math 2A, 2B, and Stat 7. So although the Joey, our fictional student, did take um, Math 10 at his community college, that's equivalent to Stat 7, um, they chose to take the Social Science 10 series, which usually we recommend unless you do have a, a love of calculus or an interest in calculus. Um, so just keep that in mind. Also, as a psych major, it's good to take the compute, I mean, the math requirement this year, your first year, so that you would be able to take number um, 14 here, um, your senior year, because it does have a prerequisite. Um, the last requirement I guess he doesn't cover um, is the school computer technology requirement. So you have the choice of ICS 31, Social Science 3A, or Psych um, 114M. Most of the time, students take um, Psych 114M or Social Science 3A. And the middle column and the right column are the other school, I um, mean, the other major requirements. So it's kind of laid out in a, a pattern. It doesn't mean you have to take them in this exact order. So even though it's numbered, it doesn't have to be in that order. Um, if you notice here, the student is in 9B, um, also taking Psych uh, 120A in fall. So F20, where you see that indicated, that just means fall. Oh, Fall 20, um, fall 2020 enrollment. So what this student enrolled in, 12 units. Um, for this student, they did um, take the equivalent to 9A and 9C, so that's what's indicated here. And they're also done with number 11, the intro courses. When you see something like this, where it says anthro one equals 2, 2B, that just means you've already taken the equivalent of that course. So you wouldn't take anthro 2B here at UCI. Um, and same with the SOCH one. So this is just kind of lays that out. Um, a common question for psychology majors is you may have taken a lower division abnormal psychology class like Joey did. He took um, Psych 37, which is abnormal psychology. Um, it does count here as that lower division psych, um, but since it was taken at a community college, it's lower division. So it's not upper division. Um, so Joey is still able to take Psych 128 because um, it, even though it is abnormal psychology, is an upper division course, so it is a little bit more in depth and they will get credit for it. Um, I've talked a lot and I do ramble on a lot and I've probably taken too much time. So I will just kind of briefly go through the rest, um, but it really just lays out itself. Um, psych core classes, four classes from this list. You'll choose a module. The experimental psych I kind of mentioned earlier, you have the prerequisites of completing the psych fundamentals and the math requirements. So do those this year so you can take that your senior year. And then this is the flexible section of just any upper division psych. Um, but if you do need kind of further explanation or anything like that, definitely feel free to um, email our peer advisors and they'll provide the email address for them um, later in the panel or reply back to that email from the full-time advisor.
but I do feel like I've talked too much. So <laughs> I will leave it at that um, and let the peer advisors take it away. All right, thank you, Estella. Um, so now uh, we're going to be moving to our panel questions, but before that, um, we will take, so I'm going to explain what a peer academic advisor is. Um, so a peer academic advisor are students just like you. We are taking classes, uh, but you know, we are also helping students because we know how hard it is to transition to a university. Uh, we went through a quarter long training to help students with scheduling classes, general academic questions, and academic resources. Today we have, uh, I believe, seven of our PAs with us today who are going to be introducing themselves. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine. I'm a fourth year psychology and sociology student and hopefully we can answer some of your questions today. Hi everyone, I'm Christine. I'm also a fourth year and I'm a double major in psychology and political science. I hope you guys can ask us a lot of questions later for the panel Q&A and you guys enjoy listening to the answers. Hi, my name is Christy. I'm a third year double major in social policy and public service and education. And thank you all for joining us. Hi everyone, my name is Marimar. I'm going to be a fifth year. I'm going, I'm a double major in international studies and public health policy and welcome to UCI. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia. I'm a third year student and double major in economics and data science and welcome to the Q&A session. Hi everyone, my name is Sam and I am a third year majoring in business economics and minoring in our history. Welcome to UCI. And we also have uh, one more PAA. Uh, she's not able to talk right now, but we have Waylon who's also here with us and she's a psychology major. Alrighty, so our first question for our panel is, how did you adapt at UCI when you first started as a new student? Okay, so I'll start. Um, so as a transfer student, um, so it took um, like about two quarters to adjust to UCI, just because everything is a little fast paced. It is 10 weeks, unlike the semester system, which is 16 weeks. Um, that is why we recommend all of you um, to enroll in 12 to 14 units so you guys could like get used to it. Also because everything is remote right now, so it's completely different than your in-person classes. Um, socially, it was a bit harder for me just because like, I didn't know anyone and I'm super shy. So, but like joining clubs and going out of my way to talking to my housemates, that helped me out a lot. So uh, like, oh, I'm not a transfer student like Karen, but uh, like her, I had a little bit of trouble adjusting socially and academically to UCI um, as a first year. And I think it's just because like, you know, the quarter system is so much faster and it was a lot the work was a lot harder than uh well high school for me and so it just took a little it took a little bit of time i would say definitely be patient with yourself um you know don't try to push yourself so hard just because i know like my first year i had a lot of really high expectations and i kind of just really compared my my experience to a lot of other people's and it was really different and if theirs was better i like would put myself down about it but you shouldn't do that you know everyone's going to have their own personal experience about um you know transitioning to uci uh, so just be patient with yourself remember that it is your first year it is a remote quarter it's a lot different than it normally would be and you have a lot of time to adjust as well um, throughout the year so just be patient with yourself keep that in mind Um, in my first year, I have a not very successful year because I think I only do the, all the basic things like enrolling, enrolling in classes and joining one club and do all the, like, all the things um, very basic and there's nothing else. Like, for example, I didn't utilize all the resources on campus. Like, I didn't go to the office hour for classes and I didn't use like career pathways or SARC to like explore my career ways. I didn't do all of these things. So I think as a transfer student, you better like to do this um, now, like even before the class started and you will get used to like to get you used to UCI like faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our next question. So how did you get involved on campus? What clubs or organizations are you in and how can students get involved? 
Uh, so one really good platform to utilize if you're looking for clubs or organizations is Facebook. I definitely recommend making a Facebook if you haven't already, uh, just because most clubs and organizations will post about their events or about how to contact them. Um, and there's also like uh, pages for specific classes. So there's like UCI class of 2024 um, and all those sorts of pages. So it's definitely a good way to get involved and meet people who are in your class. Uh, I also recommend checking your emails a lot just because a lot of organizations will email when they have like open intern positions or open club positions. Um, I was in ASUCI for two years, which is our student government, and that's actually how I found the intern position. Uh, and then usually during welcome week, we have something called the Anteater Involvement Fair, which is held in Aldridge Park. And this year we're still holding it. It will just be virtual. I would drop the link down below if you want inf more information on that, but definitely look out for that because there's going to be emails about that uh, soon. Yeah, same as Sam. Like, I looked at my emails a lot, and, like, they usually have the application link among the, the email as well, so you could just click on it and, like, apply. Um, I would definitely recommend, like, you know, joining a club, like, sometime this year, just so you could kind of get a more of a sense of, like, getting to know people at UCI, you know, doing stuff outside of just academic academics, just because you want something to look forward to. That's one of my biggest regrets when I was a freshman is that I didn't get involved as much. I was mainly focused on like schoolwork or just working. Um, so I really wish I would have started like getting to know people, feeling that community, doing stuff that I really enjoyed, giving back to campus and et cetera. So I would definitely recommend that. You know, I know there's applications open for a lot of positions on campus. So honestly, look at Facebook Facebook, as Sam mentioned, um, they have like a lot of links, like they want new people, they want new ideas. So definitely like, you know, you can apply now even before school starts and already have a position. Like, you know, you could interview and do all that. So it's just amazing experiences. Like, I feel like getting involved and like doing stuff outside of just like school, 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 like you get to meet such amazing people that honestly just changes you and makes, helps you grow into like the person you'll be when you graduate. So I'll definitely recommend that. Um, aside from a peer academic advisor, I'm also a peer health educator at the UCI Center for Student Wellness and Health Promotion. So in that position, I'm able to like facilitate workshops. I'm able to um, conduct presentations to student organizations or certificate programs on at UCI. Um, we learn about different health topics from sexual health, mental health, um, nutrition, body positivity, alcohol and other drugs. So it's a lot of, um, like health topics and if you're passionate about health or you just want to learn more I would definitely recommend it um there's a lot of psychology majors that join it so that'd be really cool like you know if you're interested in that um you get to work closely with staff you undergo like a quarter-long training so it's a very great experience um and I'll put the link for that in the chat too um, so I'm part of Foster Student Ambassadors, which is a club dedicated to helping um, current and former foster youth with transitioning, housing, and food. Um, at UCI, we have um, about 600 clubs, so we hope that you definitely like find one and join one. So uh, I provided the link on the chat, so hopefully you guys check it out. Um, I just wanted to go a little bit into depth about the link that Karen provided. Uh, so basically that link is to one of our websites, campus.orgs, campus, yeah, campus, campusorgs.uci.edu. And it basically, it's just such a great way to find a lot of clubs if you have kind of like a specific type of club in mind. Um, because once you, once you go on that website, you're actually able to look up certain clubs that you might be interested in. So say you're interested in some sort of like environmental club, you can actually put like environmental clubs into the little search bar and it'll pop up with all the clubs that are related to the environment. And so it's a really good way just to kind of, if you already have a certain club in mind, to search it out and be able to reach out and contact that club. Okay, uh, moving on. So our next question is, tell us about our campus research about a campus resource that you recommend the most and what are some resource, resources that transfer students should take advantage of? Um, so there's a resource center called the Social Science Academic Resource Center known as SARC for short, S-S-A-R-C. Um, and it's something that I would recommend to all students, not just transfer students. Um, and if you're a transfer student, you know, you should really get on that, I feel like, because you have a little less time than like the rest of the students on campus to go through it. 
but basically it's a center that helps you like establish and make way for your professional life and like your professional skill set and a little bit on your career too it really touches on a lot of things like they help you with research, internship opportunities, CVs, resumes, cover letters. Um, why is it? They even help you with your interviews. Yeah, there's like a lot of stuff that they can touch base with you on and it just varies and they like try to accommodate for each person, whether it's like how to reach out to faculty, staff, professors, instructors, or to like employers, people who are in charge of the internship you're interested in, all that stuff. They have a lot of resources. They even help you with your graduate school information. Like I interned at SARC actually last year and I've been using their resource center ever since like I got to know about it in like sophomore year, the end of my freshman year too, I think. And I'm like a fourth year now and I'm trying to go into law school and they've been such a great help to me. They've looked at my personal statement. They helped me to um, reach out to my letter of recommendation people and how to write up those emails. They've been checking my work for me. They're really with you every step of the way. Um, yeah, and they even help you to, um, as they even write up the emails, and if you're not um, sure how an interview like works, like a mock interview, they could do that with you too. They can tell you exactly what materials you should bring to an interview, like bring a notebook, bring a pencil, a pen, like all that good stuff. Um, yeah, and they give you like really good tips and tricks, like in general for all these things. If we were in person, which unfortunately we can't do that right now, um, we even had like a little library of like entrance, like graduate school entrance exam, like study books, like the GRE, LSAT, MCAT, like all those things that you could have rented out like for free, like a library. Um, and we even had like these little flyers that told you, um, I say, I would say like I still work there. They have these little flyers that tell you like how to get research, like which resources you should like reach forward to to get those opportunities you want, all those things. So. Yeah, I don't want to keep going on and on about it, but it's really good. Um, whether you're interested in trying to keep developing your skills that you're learning, you're about to learn in like UCI through your courses to like just trying to find like a job in the future or like internship or really good experiences outside of campus or in campus too, like you should really look into SARC, even if you're like not sure, honestly, um, what path you might take, you just ask questions. You can also, um, Create a consultate like create a consultation day with them. Just go onto their website. I'll put a link below if someone hasn't yet, but just start um, at uci.edu. So yeah, check them out. Um, so at UCI, we have the Transfer Student Hub. It basically consists of other programs within it, such as the First Year Transfer Experience Program. Uh, they provide workshops, LARC scholarships, so you don't have to pay for tutoring book loans, discounted printing, and like a lot more. Um, and then like if you're st struggling academically or you're on academic probation, there is the Transfer Triumph program so you guys could join. And to quickly mention, if you are a former current foster youth, uh, apply to the FIRE program, which starts for foster youth resilience and education. So it doesn't matter what age you were in the foster care system, they will accept you. This isn't like the community colleges who only accept um, foster youth who were in the system after the age of 16. So I really recommend the Transfer Student Hub and FIRE if you are a current or former foster youth. I also wanted to mention the Writing Center, which is a resource center that I've used before. Um, just like they really help you with all your essays, scholarship applications. Um, I would go in person before, but now like since everything's remote, they do hold like Zoom sessions or email consultations. So you could just email them like your draft and they'll send you feedback or you can make an appointment with them to meet with them like face to face. Um, I would definitely recommend it like they really give amazing and insightful feedback um, so you could like get those drafts up. The only thing I would recommend is that they do get packed really fast so like people really um, sign up for appointments like so soon in the quarter. So like once you know a deadline or something I would say you know sign up and like get your draft in before that happens. I'll put the link in the chat as well. I also want to mention any resources. Although it is not an organization, it's a website, it's ESI Library. Um, it's free for all ESI students as long as you log in with your ESI Net ID. And there's, there are lots of resources like articles and journals that we cannot access or are not authorized in other websites. Um, and it's very useful website when you're writing research papers or having writing classes. So I'm going to um, have the link in the chat.
Uh, I would say one more resource that you should definitely try to utilize are your um, TAs. So for every class you have like a TA and Definitely during this, um, you know, like remote quarter, a lot of people don't end up going to, you know, office hours for TAs or the professors, which is something that you really should be doing just because uh, if you're interested in like, you know, grad school later on or research, it's definitely a good way to know more about that, you know, particular subject. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend going to office hours for both your professors and your TAs just because it's a good way to network and, you know, just learn more about the profession that you're interested in. Also, to add on to what Samantha just talked about, like the professors and TAs or instructors, whoever you have, is, are very different sometimes from like what they appear on lecture versus office hours. They're very like, um, it's not, it seems they're just like more them during office hours. Like during lecture in my first year, I remember I was thinking, wow, they look so like all knowing and intimidating. I don't want to go to office hours. Um, I don't have a question, so I don't want to go even more. But then like actually had a question eventually in like my freshman year, obviously. And I was like, okay, there's no way around this. I went and I was like really scared. But there are other people in the office hour with me. And like, that's how it usually goes. There's other people with you who come by. And the professor was just so chill. He was just like, what did you guys have for lunch? You know, before we get started, such an important topic. And then, you know, there he was just like, uh, what do you think about the class? Like, was it fun? Like, did it keep your interest? Like how did the recent like research like like make you think about like he was just very like open to us about like what we thought about his class and like the feedback and he was very open to our questions too so it made it a really good experience and the people I'm getting my letters of recommendation from for my grad school application currently like they're the professors and instructors that at first when I went to their class I wasn't expecting to get to know them so well but they're the ones I grew like closest to out of all those professors that I met so you never know so you should always try So a resource that Waylon brought up in the chat uh, is the Division of Career Pathways. And um, they offer mock interviews, resume workshops. They would host like career fairs when we're on campus. We might be having virtual ones now. Um, and one of the things that like I went to um, from like the D DCP um, is like a panel. So they each panel had like a different theme and like the one I went to was nonprofits uh, with because I was interested in nonprofits but I had no idea what kind of careers or jobs were like in that field and so after I went I was very um, like enlightened I guess because I was like oh my gosh I didn't know these all existed um, and I'm like 90% sure that there's psychology ones that they've done before so um, yeah that was like my experience with them. Okay, so our next question is, you recently experienced remote learning at UCI, which is on a quarter system. Tell us about your experiences and best advice. Okay, so <laughs> I would say the quarter system and during a remote learning period, it was definitely tougher than I thought it would be. Um, just because, you know, all of your classes are online, you're not actually going to school in person anymore. So it is definitely different. So one thing I definitely recommend is keeping a schedule, uh, some sort of schedule, however you'd like to do it, you know, whether it's a planner, a bullet journal, or using, um, what is it called, Google Calendar, which is what I personally use. I love Google Calendar. Uh, just make sure that you're keeping track of all your classes. So one thing is definitely, uh, Christine always say th says this, but um, definitely look at your uh, syllabus before the quarter actually like really begin so you're able to see what deadlines uh, you need to be aware of what assignments you have just so that you're not falling behind because it is way easier to fall behind during a remote quarter just because everything's online and like you're not you're, the professor's not reminding you in class or anything so just definitely make sure you're keeping track of your classes of your assignments and take breaks um, I cannot stress this enough like being online all the time can be very just overwhelming and uh, definitely just being on your computer a lot is definitely draining as well. So just make sure you're taking time for yourself, uh, that you're taking care of yourself, you're doing something that you really enjoy and not always doing schoolwork, finding time to do, you know, fun things in your life like little hobbies or something. Um, also just keep in mind that 
since a lot of the lectures will be pre-recorded, there will be some live, but most will be pre-recorded during remote season, um, that the class schedule that you signed up for, um, for the day and time, like don't expect your lecture to be re like released that same day and time as well. That's why I expected like the first quarter for remote season, but oftentimes the professors and instructors like release the material like a week later or just like a long time later. But they would always email us like they'd be like, okay, like we're going to release it sometime around this time. And when they did release it, they would like send us an email like right away, like, okay, it should be ready to view now. Just let us know if there's any problems like looking into it and stuff like that. So you will have little reminders here and there probably from your professors at least like, hey, it's out. But yeah, just don't expect the, less, the lectures to be out like the same day and time that you would expect it to the time you signed up for. That's why keeping a planner is so important, in my opinion, like Samantha already mentioned, because you have to keep track of all the lectures that you're behind on, even if it's because it was released later. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's not your fault, you know, it's not really anyone's fault because everyone's getting used to the Zoom material and how to pre-record it and like how to handle it and how to release the material. So um, everyone just needs to be patient with each other. And that includes yourself. Be patient with yourself. Like, um, yeah, we know it's, it's very hectic. It was hectic for me, too. And I... And, you know, we all here went to college earlier and this was hectic for us because having all these lectures, having to be like, you know, access at different times is a little bit of a brain messer effort because I couldn't keep track all the time. So keep a steady schedule. Make sure you take breaks. I thought I would have to take less mental breaks um, because it's like remote. So I felt like I have more time for things, but I actually feel like I have less time for things now since um, it went remote because I can't keep track of like, the time flowing by so much now because I don't feel like I have a busy body anymore. Like I kept track of my time because I kept like going out and doing things usually, but now just I'm in one space and that makes me think like I have all the time in the world. So I guess I work a little slower than I used to do. So please don't procrastinate. Like, especially during remote season, you just can't get back up. It feels like after procrastinating because um, it's, there's, it's not like you can go out and like motivate yourself as much like, People, like what people used to do during finals. So just keep track of your time. Um, I would also say, make sure that you're still utilizing all the campus's resources, just because I know that when I moved back home and I wasn't actually near the campus and I was just kind of doing my own thing with remote learning, I like totally did not use any of the campus resources. I didn't contact any academic advisors. Um, I didn't use like, you know, uh, the Division of Career Pathways or SARC. I kind of just did my own thing. And it honestly wasn't the best decision I could have made. Um, looking back, I really wish that I'd actually utilized the campus more just because all the resources on campus, they're still here for us. Uh, they still want to help in uh, whatever way they can. A lot of them are still doing a lot of virtual events online. Uh, so just keep in mind the campus is here for you. You know, just because you may not be physically on the campus does not mean that it's still not with you, that it's still not here to support you. So yeah. Okay, so uh, next question. For our PAs who dorm or live near UCI, how do you commute around campus? What were some advantages and disadvantages? Um, so I live, I've lived on campus both years uh, at UCI. And my main way around campus was the Anteater Express, which is like a bus system that we have specifically for UCI students. Uh, it is free. You do not have to pay for it. You do not have to show any form of identification to get on. It's just really easy. You just walk on. It takes you to where you want to go. Um, I also walked a lot. Uh, where I lived, it was only around 15 to 20 minutes away from the campus. So it wasn't too bad. I got, I got really used to walking a lot just because I didn't have a car either. So when I wanted to, you know, go get groceries or something, um, I would just walk to the Albertsons because we actually have like a little shopping center that has an Albertsons, a Starbucks, that has a few places to eat um, around the area. So it's really convenient if you do not have a car and you still want to cook for yourself or you need like a small, um, you know, necessity, like a toothbrush or something. We also have a Target. Uh, so yeah, walking and then Eater Express are my two main forms of transportation. And I would say an advantage to living on campus was that I really felt like I had a community um, just because I was actually at the college. I was really close to the UCI campus itself, which was really nice because then 
when I wanted to go to class or I wanted to just go on the campus and walk around, it was really close and it was really easy to uh, just go on campus. I have friends who are already down back, at, back in like the UCI area who just go on campus for like walks in the park or picnics in Aldridge Park. Everyone loves Aldridge Park. It's a huge thing. So if you do end up going back to campus, like I love Aldridge Park. It's actually, this is my, my screen, Aldridge Park. It's so beautiful. It's like literally one of my favorite places on campus. Um, but the campus itself is just so nice, like taking walks and everything. So that was definitely an advantage. A disadvantage was, uh, you know, having to pay for housing. That was a disadvantage. And then uh, I guess also just like cooking for myself. I'm not very good at cooking. So I had to, had to figure it out. But yeah, those are my like, that's my little spiel on that. Um, like Samantha said, we do have the Anteater Express. Um, so you do, if you do live like, let's say 25 or 20 minutes away, for example, like I'm at Camino. So this is Camino, it's really pretty. Um, so yeah, like there's Anteater Express. Sometimes when I'm lazy to walk to campus, which is 20 minutes away, um, I use the Anteater Express. It's free, you don't have to pay for it. You don't even have to show your ID, just hop in. And um, so for fall, uh, the on-campus services, the bus, uh, will be on serv in service. However, all off-campus routes, so for example, um, the N8 Express that goes to West Irvine, Diamond Jamboree, or the Irvine Spectrum, uh, those will be suspended, sadly. However, if you are going to dorm on campus, uh, the other shuttles will be working. Yes, there's, oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I also just wanted to mention the Rider app, which is the app that you could input UCI, um, and then you could see all the routes and then the Anteater Express takes, so you don't have to wait too long for, like, um, a bus or, like, anything like that, so you already know, like, if you come out of class, like, once we do go back on campus, you could come out of class or, like, um, you need to go somewhere across campus, like, you already know what time it'll stop by and where, um, and then you could know, like, where, like, when your stop is going to be arriving soon. Um, I'll also put the link of the apps um, in the chat just so you could download it and then have it just in case, um, but, yeah, it's very useful because you don't want to be, like, because I remember, like, I had a three-hour night class one time, and, like, I would wait really really late sometimes so like I would be rushing like if I see my rider app that the bus is here in one minute I'll go like I would literally run to it because I did not want to wait like another 40. Um, so yeah I would definitely recommend that and I'll put that in the chat. <laughs> okay so our next question is how can students get involved in research? Are any of our PAAs involved in research? Uh, so this past year, I was involved in like a research seminar. It was part of the program in public health, but it was a year long seminar um, in which I learned about research ethics and about conducting like a known study. Um, in fall quarter, like that's what we learned. We would have like a lot of guest speakers. Um, winter quarter, we were assigned to a faculty mentor. Um, so I was assigned to Dr. LeBron, who is a professor in the Chicano Latino department and in the program in public health. So I learned so much from her. Like I was able to clean data for her for her anti-soil lead project, which was based in Santa Ana. And they kind of like uncover lead exposure um, in the area to help reduce like the health risk that it's imposed on the community. So I really learned so much about like from her about like environmental justice, environmental racism, um, like health advocacy and all that stuff. So I would definitely recommend research just because you get to learn more like you get to unleash like your curiosity and learn about more stuff beyond like just the classroom and you get to work with faculty like one on one um, and the in the spring quarter, which was remote, I was able to conduct like, uh, I was able to just um, do like media, like monitoring, monitoring for her, um, just so, to help her guide her project for like, as we're going remote. Um, I just learned so much from her that I even asked her to be my mentor this year as well. Um, so I'm going to be part of the public health honors research program. So she's gonna be mentoring me throughout this year so I could conduct my own study and then write an honors thesis. So that's very exciting stuff. So if you're interested, I will definitely do that. Um, faculty, like almost all the faculty at UCI are conducting like some sort of research since UCI is a research university. So like they're always conducting like something like, um, something that they're interested in. So like there's websites where you could see like what they're working on and like you could go to office hours and talk to them about it. Like they're always open to talk about it and love when students ask. So yeah, I would say that. So like Marimar men mentioned, uh, a lot of professors are involved in research and one way that you can find that is by using the faculty profile system. 
um, you would find the school that you're part of and then like let's say like political science psychology and um, it, the list of professors that are part of the psychology department or let's say political science it'll say their research interests or if they're part of any lab uh, basically you could email them ask them like hey are you recruiting anyone and um, like just see also there is um, the program called undergraduate research opportunities program uh, so basically right now uh, they're hosting events if you have any questions about like research if you want to get involved um, if you go to their website they have a ton of um, on and off campus opportunities um, there's also the student research interest form so basically it's a form that you fill out where you talk about yourself your research interests and your goals and then eventually a research counselor will reach out to you via email if you want to make an appointment to see what you will do from there. Also, if you're going to talk to any professor um, about their research and to talk about like, you know, if they have a spot on their lab available for you to get into, I would highly recommend, I wouldn't even say this is a recommendation like you should, but I would highly, highly personally recommend that once you find that professor that you're interested in, like say you're using the faculty search system that Karen just mentioned, um, and there's like, it should have under the professor's name, like all the subgroups that they're researching in, like what specific subject, and you're like, oh, that looks so interesting. Um, make sure you do your own separate search, like type into the Google search bar or something like ECI and like that person's name. And then um, sometimes professors have their own like website dedicated to themselves and it'll have like a list of their research like on there so you could like download some and you could read through it don't don't expect to have to understand everything like i was talking to a professor before after reading a, a paper and he was like if you understood everything like you should be going to phd program or something like that you know just make sure you can understand like kind of like the gist of the introduction like skim through you know like the body and then look through the conclusion all that stuff and then just have like a few questions available and ready to ask like that you're what you're interested in and like just really get to know what the professor um, what their research is all about and see if you're really really interested in that because research is a very very um, rewarding but also very tiring work I hear I haven't personally done it but I have friends who have conducted and done it with themselves and with professors and it just takes a lot of time and you have to write a lot you have to interact with people a lot it takes a lot of different types of skills so I'm not trying to scare, like, scare anyone, but make sure like it's worth your time, like your personal time. Like the research is obviously always worth it to anyone else, but like to you, is it worth your time and effort? Like, is this something you really want to do? Because um, if you're not, you know, if there's other things, there's other organizations, there's other clubs, there's other like office positions or something that you would definitely fit into. Like we have over 600 clubs on campus, like by itself, just clubs. So imagine how many jobs or like internships or something else you could find instead. And also someone asked us before in a different panel, like is research mandatory? It's definitely not mandatory. Um, we just, just you're gonna hear people saying they're gonna look for research or do research a lot because UC is like a very well-known research like institution <laughs> and system. So um, if you're interested even the slightest bit, definitely look into it because you should definitely take part of like all the opportunities that the UC has and you're like paying for like all these opportunities. Think about it that way. So you should try that out. So we have finally reached the end where we will be answering all of your questions that were written in the Q&A chat, basically that little button down on Zoom that's called Q&A. Uh, we will be answering your questions out loud um, chronologically. Uh, please don't write them on the regular chat because that is being used for links and resources. We can't answer questions regarding your housing application or financial aid application since that is out of our expertise, but we will try our best to answer those questions or maybe like send you a link um, so you can like go on from there. We can answer questions about our housing experiences forever or professor recommendations. Um, also, if you have any questions that pertain specifically to you, like a test score, a specific class or anything like that, email an academic advisor since you know we can't say your information out here. Um, so let's get started. Okay, Christy and I will take turns reading out all the questions. So this was already answered previously. Um, Waylon, I believe, yeah, I typed it out. Thank you, Waylon, but let's all take turns answering. So the question was, it was recommended that we take no more than 12 to 14 units this first quarter. In our following quarters, how many units should we shoot for? 
uh, Waylon already basically said it, you know, taking around 16 to 18 units is usually the normal schedule for somebody after like their first quarter. But honestly, it's okay if you continue to take 12 units, um, you know, after your first quarter as well, just because it is up to you. It's based up on, it's based off of what you think your schedule is going to be like and what else is going on uh, in your life. So yeah, but I, I, I usually take around 16 units per quarter. So to avoid taking 16 units, I actually took 12 units during fall, winter, spring, and summer. So I didn't have a summer break. I'm taking 12 units just so I wouldn't have those 16 units during fall, winter, and spring. And thanks to that, I'm still on track. Just had to take 12 units, but I'm doing good. I would also say like what everyone else said is completely true and really depends on you and your schedule of like when you're aiming to graduate because you know if you if you finish your unit sooner like you obviously can graduate faster or if you feel like you're running out of time then like yeah that's when students tend to like add on add on some hefty units you know <laughs> like the 20 units or something like that so um, just don't feel pressured to have to reach that 16 unit or 18 unit mark um, I do take 16 units too per quarter so that's like four courses per quarter that are four units each. Um, and that's been going fine with me so far, but if you still think after like the first quarter that you try out with 12 units or 14 units, that's still like a little bit hard and you would appreciate more time to get accustomed to like the quarter system and like UC system and all that, then for sure, like it's not a problem to take continuously take 12 units as long as it fits with your graduation schedule and all that. So make sure you like come like, you know, do the computation for all that math. Um, because 12 units is still a full-time student. So any other units beyond that is just like you wanting to do more. Um, something that like I kind of had to like figure out um, was that some of the programs that like I was interested in, um, they also like required like like a one or like two unit kind of thing. And so last quarter, I only took 12 units like class wise, but I was in multiple organizations that added an extra unit. And like that combined put me at 16.6 .6 units. And so I was like, why is this so much work? I'm only taking three classes, but it was because of those other units. So like, I guess that's just something else to keep in mind that like uh, some things that you may want to get involved in, it might, add to that workload, even though it's not really like a class. Okay. But I guess if nobody else has any more input, then we'll go to the next question. Uh, so this one is asking, can we explain what discussion classes are like? Yeah, so discussion classes, um, you probably know this by now, but for UCI at least, um, when you enroll into classes, if there's a discussion enlisted with that course you're interested in, then you have to enroll that discussion too. But you're going to find out um, eventually that some of the some of your professors and instructors, like they don't, um, they don't all say that it's required, like it's mandatory to go discussion. Some do say it's mandatory. Some say it's completely up to you. So it's like you don't have to go after you've enrolled, but you do have to enroll. So let's get that clear in the air. Um, but I do personally say that you should go to discussion, even if it's not mandatory, just because like right before like a quiz is about to like come by or midterm or final, for example, a lot of my discussion TAs have been so helpful and like information they summarize like from lecture and they've been really good at giving tips and tricks as to like how to tackle like the finals or midterms because some of them are repeat TAs for the same professor or instructor and they know like how their brain works you know what I'm saying so they're like you should write like this way or make sure like they give good tips like just know like your grade is coming from the TA like from the TA or the professor so don't write the way you particularly want but like how they would want you to write you know like realistic tips um, also discussions like sometimes um what is it oh yeah in terms of like remote now sometimes students don't come up at all and you might be the only student but i think that's really rare honestly that only happens like a couple of times for me um but the professors are super nice the tas are super nice like 
they always try to interact with you and they're trying to help you grow through a discussion because the whole purpose of it is to like summarize the lecture information and to also answer any outstanding like questions you have from the lecture materials. It's a really good way to um, clarify anything you had in mind like during lecture. So if you do have questions at, like in your readings or your assignments or during lecture itself, then it's good to just keep like a document of all the questions that you have. So if you don't want to email them, then you can always like get a more interactive answer through the discussion. Yeah, I want to add like discussions are usually have lots of times. Um, for me, like one time is the TA will go over the homework and um, have the quizzes and discussions. And another one is like to have group discussions. Well, in terms of quarantine is breakout rooms. So like, yeah, so it kind of depends on what class are you, are you going to take. Uh, so kind of going off of what like Olivia was just saying is that definitely for like remote quarter, um, like remote learning, discussion sections could be like a good way to also meet other people in your classes. Um, just because, you know, if you're not actually going to class in person, like you may be worried about, you know, meeting people in your classes or like meeting people at UCI in general. And discussion sections are a really good place to actually go and like just reach out to people like maybe in the discussion section say like, hey, anybody want to go over the homework or something? And it's a good way to just, you know, make like collaborative group chats. Okay, if anyone else isn't going to put some input for this one, I'll go on to the next question. Um, the next one was, thank you, Waylon, exclamation point. I also had a question about double majoring. Would it be possible for me as a transfer student to double major? If so, how challenging would it be like? So I'm not a transfer student, but I really feel like it would depend on the current major that you have and how you've kind of planned your schedule for the next two quarters, or not next two quarters, next two years. Um, I definitely think that if you want to double major as a transfer student, I'd highly, highly recommend contacting an academic advisor so you can start going over um, the possibilities and what classes you need to be taking to be on track or to even switch into that major, because that is also another thing to keep in mind. Uh, for most majors, if you want to add it on or switch into it, you do have to complete prerequisite classes. Um, so I would definitely we say uh, contact an academic advisor as well. Um, just to add on to what Samantha said, um, it might take you three years. Um, and another thing that you should keep in mind is that if you do want to double major, um, Cal Grant B, I know one of our PAAs who isn't here, um, because she's a double major and she stayed a third year, her Cal Grant B, like she just it wasn't given to her because Cal Grant B is only given for four years. So that is also something that you should keep in mind of if you do want a double major and you are going to stay here a third year, um, think about your Cal Grant B as well. Also keep in mind that not all majors and minors have the same um, length of unit requirements. So basically what I mean by that is like every major and minor will have the same GE under UCI no matter what school you're in. It's just the only difference is the length of the units, like the major requirement units that is different. So for instance, like I'm, I'm not a transfer student, but I'm a double major in psychology and political science. So my first major was psychology, but I had extra space basically. So after You'll, if you're if you're not going to double major, you're gonna find like after you finish your GE requirements and your major requirements, you're gonna have some units typically left over like that you have to fill up because you need 180 units to graduate. But you're gonna have to find like a different course, you know, like a lower div, upper div, whatever you prefer. But um, having a double major is really nice because sometimes like the unit requirement for like the second major you choose like completely like fills up the 180 unit almost like gap basically for you because that's what my political science major did for me but um, it really depends like I said on the major and minor you choose so sometimes like students think it's really hard to double major or add a minor or something like that but that's really not the case it's just like you could even think of it as helping you honestly getting your extra units but you're just like doing it in the form of like adding a different like another major or minor.
Uh, so I'll go to the next question. Um, if one of you guys attended an 18 week semester at any college, did you feel overwhelmed when you began the quarter system at UCI? Yes, I did. Um, I think it was during my, yeah, it was the first two quarters that I like was, it was just hard. And eventually my third quarter, I got used to everything, like how to study it, like during those 10 weeks, just find a way that was perfect for me. Um, so for example, during my first, uh, one of my classes for fall quarter, I did not think that I was going to pass it. As well for my second quarter, I, there was another class that I think that I thought that I wasn't going to pass. Um, but I passed them. So yeah, I did good. Um, you're gonna do good. So, you know, don't get anxious. You're, you made it here. Yeah. Um, well, Karen is our only speaking person for transfers today, but if Waylon wants to add in something in the chat, she definitely can too. Waylon is also a transfer student, so she has lots of input, she has lots of knowledge. Just currently cannot talk right now. Um, <laughs> let's go to another question. You might have already mentioned it, but how do I get started on a minor and when and who do I contact? So um, if you are interested in a particular minor from another school, uh, you would need to contact that school to learn more about the minor. You can also go online and like look and see uh, what the minor is about um, and what classes would have to be included in it. If you actually go to your degree works on your student access account, it'll actually show um, you can do like something called what if and you can pick a minor and see how many classes or what classes you would even need to take uh, to um, to complete the minor. And there are some minors that you do have to apply for, but most aren't. I think that there's only a few and I know some of them are in the uh, Palm Raj School of Business, so like accounting and management. Um, but for the most part, if you have a minor that you want to add already and you know that you'll be able to probably complete it, uh, you can actually just contact the academic advisor for your school, so School of Social Sciences, and they can add it to your transcript. Um, do keep in mind though that some minors, if they are in another school, uh, they are the classes that you would need are usually major restricted or school restricted. So you'll want to um, kind of just think about for your upcoming quarters if you're able to take that class and if you have a shot of getting the class, if you need to be waitlisted or if you have to wait for a restriction to lift. Thank you. Uh, that was a good answer. And um, Estella uh, put down in the chat uh, the list of majors and minors um, for you to check out. And our next question is, um, don't know if this question was answered or not, but is previous research experience required to be eligible for Europe or is it something that you can just sign up if you're interested? No, you don't need research experience. Uh, you could just sign up. Uh, you could even just like, you know, sign up for their um, events. You don't need previous research. I mean, that's why the program is dedicated to help you uh, build that research experience. Yeah, even freshmen can get involved in research. Like it doesn't matter what year you're in. Um, yeah, that's to my knowledge anyway. Like a lot of freshmen like that I knew were going into research and like, when I was interning as um, SARC last year, the people who already had research like were looking for other ones, <laughs> but they were like um, they were like freshmen, and I was like, well, I guess we're really ahead of your game. So I didn't know like you could get started so early until like last year when like the freshmen came in, and I was like, okay, yeah. So I think it's really open to all people. Uh, something I want to add about Europe is that if you have like a specific research proposal that you are interested in and kind of want to do, you are also able to apply for grants to fund that proposal. So that's just, you know, like a little extra thing about Europe. Yes, currently we don't have any more Q&A questions in the Q&A box. Please fill it up. Fill up lots of questions. How much time do we have? We have like, dang, we still have 30 minutes um, for you guys. So please make good use of it. Like you could literally ask us anything. We, we came as your PAs, but like we came really as students for you guys today because we want to share everything we had to go through. Like you can ask about internships, you can ask about like career 
stuff. I don't know. You can ask about graduate school. Some of us are interested in graduate school. Um, people have asked us in previous panels, like fun stuff, like what can you eat at Irvine? All of us are really excited to answer that question for you. Like what are some boba places? We love boba. Um, people ask like what are some good hiking places? What are like pretty places or fun places to go around Irvine? What can you do on campus? Um, yeah, what are some other questions? Like there was some, someone asking like about a tattoo, like what tattoo will we get? But let's not ask that question here. Um, what are good reading places on campus? You know, yeah, it's really wide. You guys can ask anything, so. So yeah, ask any questions. If not, we're just going to be staring at the screen for 30 minutes. <laughs> so yeah, this is your time. Go ahead and ask anything. Like no question is too, too broad or too specific, or maybe it could be too specific, but no question is like not considered. So if you have something bugging your mind, you can always ask and we will always try our best to answer it. Um, do some of the psychology majors want to share your favorite psych course or your favorite professor? Um, so before I answer that, actually, there is a I think it's not a question, but someone posted in the regular chat, uh, please debate what is the best boba place. <laughs> um, I like class 302. Like I love, I love class 302. Um, I also know that <laughs> this is not like necessarily a popular opinion, but I just love share tea mainly because it's so close to campus and it's just there. It's so easy access. Um, but one that's a little bit farther that I absolutely love is Seven Leaves. Love Seven Leaves. I wish it was closer, but it's like literally like 25 minutes away and kind of far. So, but those are like my top three. My favorite one ever, hands down, is Class 302. Some other good ones. I have gone far and wide for some good boba while I was in Irvine, like Garden Grove too. It has been explored. Um, but some good ones that are nearby, more nearby campus, you'll have to take a car though. So hop on to someone's car, hop onto a friend's car if you don't have one. Um, there's Tancha. It opened last year. Unfortunately, as everything went remote, um, tears. But it's really good if you like the creamy bobas. Um, definitely try out there. And if you like the creamy bobas, again, um, go to Omomo. I know people think it's like overrated, but okay. It's so good that there's always a line. So unless you're like super lucky, <laughs> there there's always going to be a line. But when I first went, I was like, there's no way it's worth such a long line, but it was worth it, honestly, for me. It was really good. People there working are so nice. So, yeah. Uh, just to give a little detail about what class 302 is, it's basically like yogurt land for boba. So, basically, you pick your own boba, your leash jelly, I think that's what it's called, uh, whatever you want. Then you pick your drink, and then they seal it for you. So, yeah, visit class 302. It's basically a yogurt land for boba. I still want to say, like, because um, I, I got lots of boba in lots of places, I still think the boba in Chaporty is the best because it's so soft and so creamy, and I just love it. Okay, I guess we can move on to <clears throat> professors <laughs> um, for psychology. Um, well, I almost like majors, so I'll share my favorite professor so far. Everyone's really great, but I just really want to like really applaud these people. Hagedorn, such an amazing professor. He has so many courses. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he did the 120 module series. And there's just like, he did so many, like he did like psych of music, like psych of creativity, like he did so many. I think, I seriously think I took all of them. They were just so good. and. Just the fact that I think his class was like early in the morning, I think it was 9 a.m. or something like that. But like my friends who di who will die before literally going to an early class, like they all took his class because he's just so like soothing and he's so kind and everyone loves listening to this guy. Like he's just so like good at what he teaches and it's very interesting. All the topics are never boring. Like they, and the courses, it's interesting because if you take all of them, they kind of connect together in the end through what he teaches because you know generally this is about psychology and you're just like wow some big brain power some big brain power right there um another really good professor um is professor lee michael lee um he teaches cognitive science and honestly it was a little bit um, more challenging for me because it's a lot of conceptual like a lot of conceptual ideas 
but his um, lectures were really up to date with like current research. So for our course, at least, we didn't use like a textbook. He just like literally just gave all the information on the lecture side and stuff like that. I don't know if he changed it, but it was really cool because everything was really fresh and up to date. He's very kind, very responsive, always out there to help the students. So don't feel like scared to talk to him. Um, yeah, I'll leave some for the other <laughs> others. So I love Professor Jacqueline Lewis. She's the sweetest and the cutest. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, she's also a therapist. In case you're interested in therapy, uh, you can go to her office hours and ask her questions. Um, I So far, I, I took three classes with her, which was um, clinical psych, uh, personality theory, and right now I'm currently taking her abnormal psych class with Catherine. Which, and um, let's see. And she's also teaching psych of violence for fall, which I'm also enrolled in. So I'm basically taking four classes with her. Um, yeah, I recommend Professor Jacqueline Lewis. She's the sweetest. Oh, and she also helps foster youth, which I, I really love, so yeah. Uh, yeah, all of the professors that have been named are all amazing. Um, I really like Dr. Lee's class. I think it was 140C that I took with him and it was really interesting. So if you're into like the cognitive science um, side of psych, I also recommend Dr. Brewer. She, I took her um, brain disorders class and in the fall, I'm taking her neuroperception class. So if those are topics that interest you, um, she's very, um, she's amazing. She always answers questions. She's really nice. She's a PhD and an MD. So she like can really answer a ton of questions. So she's really great. I highly recommend her. Others? Oh, do we have any other psych people? No, right? Way with them. She can always go in the chat. <laughs> Um, okay, another question. Sometimes, oh, do you have something to say, Olivia? Yeah, like as I'm not a psych person, uh, I still got psych 7A for my G class, and I got Hector for that, and I just love that class. I mean, that class is, is like 8, 8 a.m. class in the morning, and I'm still not a morning person, but I went to his course like every week for every class, so I just love that course and love Hector. Yes, it's a good thing that some lower divs are also talked about because I think a lot of the professors we talked about was upper div. Thank you, Olivia. Um, yeah, sometimes I feel awkward and like I'm being a bother to my professor staying, but I do by going to office hours. Have any of you ever experienced this feeling? Oh, yeah, I just answered that right. Same. Like, I think it's really strange or okay, it's really great if you haven't felt that way before, but um, I have some really talkative friends too, like really extroverted friends, and they still felt really awkward when they first went. Like some sometimes, like my friends were like, "I know you're not taking this course, but can you please come to this this discussion with me?" Because like at, for the first time, like in, in office hours, it's really strange, right? Like you never had to talk to a professor or instructor before. Like you don't, you didn't particularly have to talk to faculty before. You definitely didn't have to talk to a TA before. You know, it's just kind of different. And you know, when you see them in front of lecture, they just seem so. Up, like they just seem so up there to me in the beginning and they still do sometimes because they're just so smart and like they're so intellectual like I'm like I am nothing <laughs> compared to you it felt like but then when you go you're gonna realize like professors and faculty and stuff like they're all people too they all get you know a little bit anxious too when students come in sometimes because they're like oh I wonder like how they liked my class like I wonder how like you know they perceive me like they have these questions too so whatever fears you're facing i'm sure like at some point that person in the office hour you're going to also felt the same way um so even if you just kind of sit there and sometimes you don't know what to say like they they even like fill it in for you in the silence like oh what did you think about this like did you really get this like do you need more help with this and yeah i would just say if you feel really awkward for the first time and you're worried about talking to like a professor, at least start off with the TA. TAs are a little bit more, um, they're more like, they're still like a student, right? They're like a PhD student now though. So um, you can try practicing with them, you know, a little bit and just be like, um, you can also ask them too, like how, how do you usually talk to a professor? Like that's not a question at all. Like I feel like PhD students get all sorts of questions as a TA, so you could ask too. Um, just a, 
just to add on to that, I definitely feel the same way going to office hours. I always feel so awkward. And I also, I always feel like I have to be super formal with professors. Like, I feel like if I'm not being, you know, like, yes, how is, yeah, I just, I always feel like I have to be super formal. That's not, that's not the case. I mean, obviously, like, be respectful and everything, but you don't, you don't have to feel overly, like, anxious about what you're doing or how you're talking um because i know that i just i don't want to sound stupid <laughs> and that's just like a, always a big fear of mine but just you know it's okay like and it's okay if it's a little awkward at first i mean if you are meeting a new person and they are your professor but it gets better uh the more you go uh, we have another question um, are there any jobs on or off campus that we've really enjoyed or not enjoyed? Um, I guess I can speak about a job that I had last year, which I worked in Mesa Court, which is one of the first year, um, like the freshman living communities. And I really love that job. Um, I feel like it was, I mean, yeah, it was a job, but like, during like our staff meetings, you would have like icebreakers and like fun games and like we got into families um, with each other or like, yeah, families. So like 40 divided by like four families. So each of like 10 of us in a little small group. So you get, get to know each other better. Um, so yeah, I would recommend, I, well, like applications are already closed for the like, coming year, but like if you're interested in it for like your fourth year or like um, whatever, um, yeah, Middle Mesa Court and also Middle Earth is the other um, freshman, um, like, on-campus community. So those are really, like, I recommend those. Um, I have experience, like, with an off-campus job, but just, like, a quick PSA about off-campus jobs. Um, they tend to be less willing to work with your school schedule. Um, if they do want to work with you, that's fantastic. Um, just make sure you double-check because... Sometimes they want you to work hours that you might have class and then you might have to do some like negotiating or um, other. So just keep that in mind. But um, my first year and then partway into my second year, I worked at Disneyland. So um, that was really fun. But like it's far kind of like during rush hour and new hires, like you usually work like <laughs> closing shifts. So like six to 1 p 1 a.m. So um I liked it and similar to Christy, like it was more of like, it felt like a family, like it was a job. Yeah, but it was super fun. But um, just like an overall warning about off campus jobs, is like they might be less willing to work with you um, when your school schedule. So just make sure you keep that in mind if you wanna work off campus. So PAA or peer academic advisor is an on campus job. I love it. I literally love being a peer academic advisor. I've only been it for, um, a couple months now, but it's great. Uh, another on-campus job that I have, uh, I work for the undergraduate admissions office uh, as a campus rep, and we're basically like the tour guides for the school. I love that job too. Um, so those are these are both two jobs that I absolutely love, and uh, I know applications come out in like winter quarter for both, so definitely keep those in mind if that's something you're interested in. Yes, like Samantha said, I love being an academic advisor, peer academic advisor. I always enjoyed it like even before I became a peer academic advisor when I was at a community college I would always help my friends with their ed plans um, so yeah like I would definitely recommend this job if you're interested in academic counseling of any sort um, applications I believe open December so um, if you're yeah you're transferring if you want to apply um, apply in December and then you hopefully get the job in your senior year so yeah Okay, I guess we'll move on to the next question. Um, what can we expect for our class schedules? Because it's 10 week quarters, can we expect classes every day from Monday to Friday? Has anyone had a schedule like that or the opposite? Uh, you would most definitely have classes Mondays to Fridays. I mean, I have, cause like, um, so from what I've seen, psychology courses are, on average, either Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, or Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I haven't seen any Mondays, Wednesdays. Like maybe there's like just a Tuesday class or just a Thursday class, 
but on average, typically it's Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, or Tuesdays, Thursdays. Um, you could still, um, for me personally, I think I've always had like Mondays to Mondays to Friday um, schedule courses just because like I usually take an average of four courses per quarter. So it's, I don't like having like a lot of courses, like classes in one day because it tires me out. But for some of my friends that I know, like they kept, they were able to schedule it. So like at least one day of the week is like completely free for them. So they don't have to like worry about courses and stuff like that. So it is possible like as Karen said, like for the psychology major requirements, they're usually on those days, like as a set for the lectures. So besides that, you could just manipulate your other G courses or other courses you want, like on whatever day usually you prefer. Um, so you can have um, days that are free. It's possible. Um, the next question is, what are you guys' career goals? I guess uh, I could, okay. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to take a gap year. And the reason why I'm going to take a gap year is so I could get more involved in research and do internships because I am still undecided of what I want to do for grad school. I have three things in mind. I am really interested in law school. I'm interested in developmental psych and clinical psych. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in, let's say, like developmental and clinical psych is because I was a, um, a former foster youth. So I really want to help um, students who were like, who experienced those same experiences as I did. So I was like, hey, you know, like maybe help them out too. And at law school, same thing, help foster youth, they need the help. Um, but yeah, like, I feel like nobody should feel pressured to go into like grad school right away, especially like if you're unsure, because I don't know, to me, I feel like you should be passionate about what you want to do in grad school because if you apply to a PhD program and you figured out like, you know, I don't love this, you know, you're wasting like your money and your loans and your fellowships to something that you're not passionate about. So like, you know, if you want to take a gap year, take that gap year and like, see your passion. Yeah, same, just like Karen, I'm gonna take, after I graduate, I'm gonna take probably like, two years to just work and like research or internships is just something related to like what I hope to do which is like public health because I do want to go to grad school to get my master's in public health um just I really want to know like I want to be sure of like my specialization before I do so um but ultimately I do want to work in like community engagement and like health education and advocacy um just because just because I grew up in a low-income neighborhood so like I want to help combat like um, health disparities. Um, personally, for me, um, I'm one of Karen's career options. Like, I'm planning to go to law school, um, a graduate school, basically. So this summer, I've been working on law school applications. And yeah, my email actually, <laughs> speaking of that, like, it's been bombarded by emails like, oh, our application's opened, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I know, because they all open on, they usually, most of them off, like open on September 1st. So that's been wonderful stress. Um, but I want to be so far a trial attorney or a corporate attorney. So those are my options so far. And yeah, I definitely agree with what Karen and Maddie and I were saying. Um, graduate school is so much money. <laughs> It's so much commitment, you know, and some graduate schools really just do take a toll on you. Most of them do. Um, yeah, so for your mental health and for your financial bank health, you know what I'm saying? Um, make sure you think it out if you're planning on going to grad school too. As for a gap year, um, if you don't know what that is, it's basically like a year after you, you take a year off after you graduate or however much time you want. Some graduate schools, um, Say that's fine but some graduate schools actually prefer you not to take a gap year so make sure you look into that too if you're interested in those things okay we have some silence so i'm gonna go on to the, to the next question um if you wanted to go to medical school is there a different set of courses you need to take along with courses for your major and if so where would i find that information on what to take Yes, um, you have to take, 
I believe like a lot of biological courses and chem courses, I did look that up, but I'm basing this off of UCI. If you do want to apply to medical school as a psych major, I would recommend the BS in psych instead of the BA. Uh, so in case you are a BA in psych, change, um, you know, talk to an academic advisor to see what classes you need specifically to um, change it to a BS in psych, just because the BS, um, you take a lot of biological courses. Um, and then it also depends on the medical school program that you wanna go to. So also see like what other courses you need besides biology, most likely chemistry and physics um, to apply to medical school. Thank you, Karen. Um, so our inbox is empty again. <laughs> um, yeah, there's only like 10 more minutes, so I don't you know. Y'all have any other last minute questions or? Keep the questions going. <laughs> Um, well, meanwhile, there's like some questions coming out. Hopefully, I am going to post our, hold up, one, okay. I will be posting our peer advising email, our regular advising email, a little to learn more about us, the transfer email, and our office of admissions email, so you guys can send in your transcripts. Uh, so I will be posting that right now, so you guys could just check it out. Christine, we have questions. Yay. Uh, okay, so this one's asking, what's your favorite part about UCI? Wow, um, what a loaded question. Um, I love the community that, um, unfortunately, like, currently, you can still build an online community, but I think for me, there's something about being on campus that really made me, like, feel very energetic. That sounds really weird, but, like, the energy from all the people, like, everyone's like relatively stressed out. I'm not saying like that's a good thing, but it's like a commonality among everyone. So, and I'm like really jealous of the people who aren't stressed out, good for them. But I think like my actual favorite part is the campus itself. Like I think the campus is really beautiful. Um, I like taking pictures of campus just cause like, it's really nice. The architecture is really nice. The landscaping is well done. Like I really thank all the like hardworking men, women and other people who like do all the landscaping and like keep the campus beautiful because they really do an excellent job. Um, so I think that for me is my favorite part, but I do like the community that um, UCI feels like. It feels, it's huge, but it feels very like, close knit, so. Um, so my favorite part about UCI, well, one personally is because they help foster youth despite whatever age you are in the foster care system. And not a lot of UC schools do that. They're like community colleges, like only until you were like 16 and after, or they don't have a foster youth uh, program to help them. And another thing that I like about UCI is the science library. It's so pretty when you go all the way on top, like the scenery is just, it's beautiful. I don't know, like if you're into science and math, go to the science library, I love it. Yeah, I was just gonna mention like, just as Catherine um, said, like we love the community. I feel like at UCI, I've definitely met like some of my greatest friendships, people that I really am so inspired by. And like, I just, I just cherish so much. So I just, I'm very grateful for UCI for that. I'm very grateful for like all the opportunities it has given me in terms of like my involvements and, you know, working as a peer academic advisor um, from studying abroad, which is like one of my most cherished memories at, during my time here. Um, so yeah, I'm just super grateful for that. Like I will definitely say like take advantage as much as you can, like at your time at UCI, like this is a new chapter for you. Um, so definitely just, do everything you want to like if you can like you know do research like get involved in clubs like study abroad too like do everything you want to like 
this is your college experience so like this is all you like everything you like make the most out of it like undergrad is only once in your life so take advantage as much as you can mm -hmm. okay let's go on to the next question thank you for all the wonderful answers um let's see i tend to procrastinate do any of you struggle with this and how do you combat it yeah i can go on this one too oh wait <laughs> yeah um i think even if you're the type of person not to procrastinate, you will definitely feel like that struggle near the end, like near finals time, like, or near the end of the school year, like, oh, I feel so like slow now because you just keep having to work, you keep having to study, there's all these midterms and finals and it keeps coming and then summer comes, you know, like you have to keep going. You have to find a way to get motivated. Personally, for me, that's why I keep using a planner. Um, I write, I literally, that's why I keep talking about course syllabuses, like Samantha was mentioning earlier to other panels, because I, even though your syllabus tells you like all the deadlines, like when your midterm is, when your final is, I, and when your assignments do, I literally rewrite all that out at my own pace in my planner. Like, um, it takes some time because it's all these courses, but you can write instead of like on the exact date of when your midterm is, for example, like two weeks in advance in your own planner, like, oh, you have a midterm coming up, like first midterm coming up for this class. And then you'll be able to like study for two weeks before at least um, the actual midterm. Um, so it's like your own schedule that you like promise yourself basically to keep. And personally for me, I like to um, get up early in the morning and then do all my work and then at a certain time I try to like stop working like six or seven um, during the weekend at least that's a schedule I try to keep and then um, that's it like I keep studying for that long like I take breaks but they're very short and then the rest of the night is like mine I can like relax I can watch shows I can eat as much as I want <laughs> I can take a shower I can hang out with friends like that's all me and it's just so good because at first it'll be hard to keep because you're going to want to like divert your attention to other fun stuff. But once you realize how good it is, like you won't turn back because um, you don't have to worry about the stuff you didn't do the whole day. I would say that I, I procrastinate so much and it's not like it's I have I have a planner. I have a schedule. I like make goals and I put what I have on my Google calendar and I still procrastinate still badly procrastinate. So I think the main thing that you really need to do is like hold yourself accountable because you can do everything you can write it out. But if you don't do it, like it won't mean anything, you know, and it's really hard sometimes like it really is like trust me. I, I totally understand like it's so easy to procrastinate even when it's all laid in front of you like all the things you need to do but just you know like what what, what um christine said is that like after you've done it you'll feel so relieved and you won't feel you know sad or like you let yourself down later on so just remember that you're doing it in the moment you're getting your work done so you don't have to worry about it later yeah like i'm a like I'm a huge procrastinator and it's really bad. Like my attention span's really short too. So like even if I try to go to work, like I get distracted so quickly. So um, the way I combat it is I always try to reward myself with something. For example, like in the nighttime, I make plan with a friend, make plans with a friend to like watch a show together or something so I could work hard throughout the day. And then I'm like, okay, like in the night, I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna talk with a friend. I'm gonna watch a show. Like I would just give myself little rewards like that. Um, I'll make sure to like give myself breaks to like I would work hard for like let's say like a couple days and like get a lot of assignments done and then give myself like maybe a whole day for myself where I could just chill like at home or just um, go talk with friends or whatever like just so I could get like that strength to continue on like the day after or so so definitely that's the way I would combat it like it's just kind of like you know work hard but also remember to like take care of yourself and your mental health and like get all that strength and willpower to keep going too. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we have like one more question, but I just really want to say like, what works for me is like, this might not work for everyone, but I really like operate on tough love. So like, if I do procrastinate and I'm like scrambling to get something done, like I very much so feel that like, I really sit in that feeling and be like, this is why you don't do this. Like recognize <laughs> that like you could have avoided this. That's what I did. I've recently done that with a project or like a assignment. And I was just like, if I would have just stuck to the plan, like again, holding myself accountable, like Sam said, and like, please do that. Like, and if you don't do that, sit in those feelings of like, man, 
this is why I don't want to do this because this sucks. So like, if you don't want to feel that way, especially in the remote quarter when everyone is like super go, go, go all the time, like on zoom or whatever. So don't stress yourself out more than you need to. And like, definitely hold yourself accountable and like take breaks. Like everyone said, it's just tough love sometimes works. It's just a great deterrent for me. So. Uh, there is one last question. Um, so thanks for answering my last question. You're welcome. Um, while we are at the Ant Eater Involvement Fair, which is going to happen virtually, what clubs do you guys want us to check out? Maybe we could just name them. <laughs> I guess I don't have like a specific recommendation, but I would definitely say something that you're interested in. Like, um, you know, I don't think like we should get recommend I mean you should I don't know I don't know how to like explain but definitely check out a club that you're interested in or something that you think might help you figure out what you want to do in the future like for grad school or something just so you know you could just figure it out but I won't recommend like a specific one Yeah, like what Karen said, I think it really just depends on what you're interested in. Um like I'm in the women's club of women I mean, I'm on the women's club volleyball team, which is technically a club, but it's also very specific. You know, it is volleyball. So if you're not like interested in volleyball, it wouldn't necessarily be for you. Um, but you know, if there is definitely something that you're really interested in, that's what you should be looking for at the club. I know there's also like psychology clubs. Um, I'm not as, you know, familiar with that, but there's so many clubs. You would definitely find something that you really enjoy. Remember that this is a club for you. It's not a club for anyone else. Um, even if your friends want to like do something else, you know, and. Like, if you're not interested in that club, just be like, I'm not interested in that club, but thanks for inviting me, you know, because I know peer pressure is a thing, you know, it's a thing, it's alive, it's everywhere. So if you're not interested in a club, don't do it unless you want to try it out just to experience it. But just know, like, this club should be for you. It should be, like, for your happiness, for your sake. So hopefully, like, you know, you'll only focus on, like, what you want out of the club. Alrighty, well, it is now 3.32, so thank you guys all for coming and joining our transfer Q&A. We appreciate it so much that you have stayed this hour and 30 minutes long. Um, so, yeah, good luck at UCI in your first uh, quarter here. Um, you guys made it, so you will again.